Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Laura Candler from Teaching Resources, and I am so excited to be back with another webinar um, in the Interactive Teaching Made Easy webinar series, um, and another webinar about flickers. Um, if you missed the first webinar, uh, we will let you know where you can get the uh, replay version of it. And I will just say up front, if you haven't used Plickers, um, you may be a little confused by some of the details that I'm sharing today, but you will not have one problem after you go back and look at the first one. Um, I also want to mention, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the first one, but I I'm not affiliated with Plickers in any way. It's just I found out about Plickers um, maybe about five or six months ago, and I just I just think it's amazing. It's free, and you know my mind just kind of started going crazy on all these different ways that it could be used. And um, so I've uh, you know this is the webinar is a way that I that I'm sharing it. So, anyways, uh, just a little background there on the series and what's going on. Um, I also wanted to mention that there are two. Facebook groups, um, a K5 and a 612 Facebook group of teachers who are using clickers in their classrooms. And I really want to give um, kind of a shout out to them because many of them shared ideas and classroom photographs for this webinar. And I, there's just no way I can recognize everybody individually by name, but um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody who's watching knows that I, um, I, you know, I really appreciate all the sharing and the awesome ideas and uh, my role is kind of passing it on and hopefully more people will join the group and keep sharing ideas as they um, as they discover them. So let's take a look at the agenda here. Um, really short introductions today since um, I did a longer one at, uh, in the first webinar, a little overview of what's going on. The main part of the presentation is Clickers 102 Beyond Assessment and you'll have a better understanding of that. Um, of that title in a few minutes. And I have a few uh, free resources I'll be sharing, links to free resources, and a giveaway at the end. I'll be giving away a, a set of those clickers cards that you see that are actually from Amazon. They're laminated. They're really nice. And I did want to mention you will have to be present at the time of the drawing. And you need to be signed in with your first and last name in order to be eligible um, because when a winner is chosen, I'll have to be able to um, check the records, the registration records, and, and find you and contact you. And I want to um, say thanks again to uh, Peggy George, who's the moderator. And if you were here uh, prior to the um, very beginning when I started, she did a, a walkthrough of the webinar environment for us. And she's got a very active role. Um, behind the scenes, there's absolutely no way I could do this without her. But uh, what Peggy does, one thing she does during the webinar is she watches what's going on in the chat area and she collects ideas and questions and things. And then at the end of the webinar, she will like bring them back to me. And then that's in the closing part, the question, answers, and sharing. Um, so, And then she will also help if people have issues um, you know, she helps in the chat area and everything. So she is amazing. And I did want to, uh, she, she, Peggy um, is a one of the co-moderators of the Classroom 2 Live um, show on Saturdays. And she, um, we're able to use this webinar environment due to the generosity of Classroom 2 Live. And at the very end of the webinar, she'll tell you a little bit about how to get involved with that. So um, thanks so much. Peggy for, for all that you do. Um, and I am going to keep the introductions brief today. Um, most of you probably know something about me, and you probably know my website, Um It's I have a free online file cabinet and strategies and all kinds of things for teachers. And I also, a few years ago, started a blog where I do a lot of sharing of ideas. The website is kind of more like a storage place. And then a lot of the sharing of how I um, do things in the classroom or how I did. I'm a retired teacher now, but I taught for um, about 30 years, upper elementary. And so the ideas that I share are from my classroom experience. 
Um, so we want to learn a little bit about you. So if you would use the tools um, as soon as they're activated and put a check or a starburst or whatever where you are. I'm in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And also in the chat area, if you would um, type where you're from so we can all kind of see where everybody's from. Usually we do have a lot on the East Coast, and I know that's um, because it, of the timing of hopefully most of you have had your dinner by now, and it's a little bit harder for people in other parts of the U.S. and definitely in other parts of the world. So it's great to see everybody and see where everybody's from. Awesome. Peggy says you can't use the whiteboard tools if you're on a mobile device. So sorry about that. but. Anyway, as you can see, that people are from all over. OK, Peggy, um, whenever you're ready, why don't we turn off those tools before we go to the next slide, if you'll just let me know. Are we good? OK, she said she's ready. All right, so um, this is, and I apologize for the um, the question for those of you who are here for the you know material right before I had the arrow out of place. But if you look right here, um, the question is rate your level of knowledge and or experience with clickers. And we did the same question um, in the first session, and a lot of people put that they didn't know very much about it or they'd never actually used it. So this time I'd be interested to see if we have a few more people who actually have used it with their students or maybe used it with teachers in a workshop or used it frequently or whatever. So if you would use that polling tool and then select the letter of the answer. Um, I see a lot of people typing it in the chat area. And what we'd rather have you do is use the polling tool and select A, B, C, or D, because Peggy's going to be able to send that out, and then we can see the results of that. So if you just typed it in the chat, if you would use the polling tool and um, enter it that way, then we can compile the data. And you know, it's, it's helpful to me, too, um, because it's good to know whether most people have used clickers before or not. Hopefully, you would have, or you would have at least watched the webinar. OK, so Peggy, do you think maybe we're ready to see the results of that? OK, so um, okay, so we've got 14% um, um, are not very really, really familiar, and about 17% have never used it, but they've learned about it. And then we have, looks like we have about half that say that they've used it once or twice, or they use it frequently. So awesome. And I'm hoping that after you watch this session, if you didn't get the first one, you'll go back and, and start with that one, because it's really step by step. This one's sort of like the little extra you know, um, icing on the cake kind of session about more things that you can do with clickers. OK. so. Um, if you are new to Plickers, you might be wondering, what does it stand for? And it, Plickers stands for Paper Clickers, because it's a system that um, the Plickers folks came up with where it's kind of like QR codes plus uh, sort of replace the um, handheld clickers that are rather expensive in the classroom. So it's a really innovative system. And the description on their website is that it's a powerfully simple tool that lets teachers collect real-time formative assessment data without the need for student devices. Now, the reason I read that to you is I wanted to emphasize that even on the Plickers website, you know, the primary purpose that they have is for formative assessment data. And, um, and that's awesome. I mean, it's terrific for that. And that's what was covered in the first webinar about how to get started with clickers with, um, for assessment purposes, um, how to save time putting in the questions by using task cards, um, how to use clickers interactively in your classroom to improve instruction. Like I went over all of that in the first session. So today's session is going beyond that. Um, and, and looking at it and saying, what else can we do with clickers? And I guess I first kind of came onto this idea in the Facebook group. Teachers were sharing different things that they were doing with clickers, like using it for class voting and, and all kinds of things. And that's when I thought, 
I want to share that. I want to take these great ideas and I want to share them with others um, and let the, you know, the Facebook group be a place for sharing, but also to share out with others who aren't in the group. So there's two basic um, sort of um, strands going on here. I'm going to first share an idea about how you can use clickers with cooperative learning, which I know it was not designed at all to be used with cooperative learning, but that's kind of where my mind goes when I see something really neat like this. And then I'm going to be doing the second part of it is just different innovative ways that you can use um, the poll feature to ask questions and interact and engage with your students. Now, I had originally had some kind of hope that this session, you know, was going to be really short and like 20 minutes. Um, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> I just want you to know up front, um, I just kept adding more and more today. It's like I kept thinking of more ideas. This is so exciting. I would think, oh, I want to tell them about this, and I want to tell them about this. So just be aware that if you read my description and thought it was just going to be 20 minutes um, and you have to leave, you can always come back and watch the replay. But it is fun to be here, and it's really great to you know, see the ideas that are being shared in the session. So I hope that if it does, if it's a little longer than I anticipated, um, I hope that you'll hang around because it'll be a lot of fun. So one thing you probably know if you have followed me for any length of time is I love cooperative learning. I just think it's awesome. I, you know, pretty much always have. Um, I got most of my training through Kagan Cooperative Learning, which I would highly recommend. Um, but I've also, you know, just picked up a lot of ideas, tested things in the classroom, come up with some of my own strategies, and that's what I want to share with you really throughout this whole webinar series. The Clicker's um, first session was a little bit unusual in that it really wasn't based on cooperative learning, but most of the rest of the sessions are going to have quite a bit of cooperative learning because I really believe strongly that it's a great way to, to teach kids. So I have a page on my website with cooperative learning resources. And Peggy, I don't think that I put that link in the list of links I gave you. But if they just go to lauracandler.com and they click on strategies the, under the drop down menu, um, they can get to the cooperative learning page very easily. So why do I think cooperative learning is so amazing? Well. This is one quote that is actually on my website. I'm sure you've heard of it. But this means a lot to me. I think it's so true. What children can do together today, they can do alone tomorrow. And that is just to me so powerful. And I'm just, I just pulled up. This is a picture from my classroom. And I just think about measurement and how much trouble kids have measuring or finding the circumference of something or whatever. And but after they work together on things, it's amazing how later they can do those things on their own. And another quote that I actually just heard it today. I'm sure I heard it before. But I bet you've heard this one. But I don't know. It just really stuck in my mind today is this one. Have you ever thought about whoever is doing the talking is doing the learning in any situation, really? If you're talking about you know, um, in the classroom or presentations or whatever, that's kind of what's hard for me, as this is not really my presenting style. When I'm in, in a room with real people <laughs> in a room with me, I don't talk the whole time. So I'm really glad to have the chat area. That's kind of like your, your place to talk and share ideas. But I just think this is so powerful, because so many times in the classroom, um, we as teachers do a lot of the talking. We're trying to cover a lot of content, but we don't give the kids um, as much of an opportunity to talk as perhaps we should have. So this is where my mind was kind of going with clickers. I thought it was amazing for assessment, but I was thinking there's got to be a way that we can connect this um, with some kind of cooperative learning activity. So I do have one that I will share with you. And I had some teachers testing it out since I don't have my own classroom. This week I gave them the directions and let them check it out and make sure that it worked OK. And, and it um, seems to do so. Um, so before we move into that, I want to just bring to mind um, three things that I think are really important with cooperative learning. I mean, there's many things that are important, but these are just three that I want to focus on. Um, 
I think it's really important to provide structure in a cooperative learning activity so that everybody's participating equally. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, group work, in my mind, is not equal to cooperative learning. When you just you know, put kids together in a group and you say, here, you know, do this or solve this problem together or talk this over or do this science experiment, you know who's just the bossy kids are going to jump in there and they're going to take over and then the other kids aren't going to have a chance. So you have to provide some structure. You need to provide some time for discussion. Um, just because kids are working together, if they have to do it in total silence, the learning is just not going to be there in the same way that it will if you provide discussion time. And then you need to somehow build accountability in for students so that they're all participating. And you know, you can't have that kid who's over there cleaning out his or her desk while the rest of the team is doing all the work. You know, you've seen that before. Um, so somehow you've got to figure out how to put some structure to it so that there's accountability and they all have to participate. So when we look at cooperative, uh, this cooperative learning activity that I'm going to share, we're going to look at those things, but even more than that, I want you to be thinking about how you might be able to use, you know, maybe adapt or modify activities for cooperative learning, but when you do, ask yourself if it has these um, three key features. I want to take an example of where, you know, I told you that when I see something, I try to think, like, how could I get cooperative learning in there? And a couple of years ago, I heard about the game Scoot, where the, you guys have probably heard of it, or you probably used it, where the kids are getting up, um, they move from desk to desk in the classroom, they're answering questions that are on task cards, they write it on a recording form or whatever. And I have not actually used it that way in my classroom. Um, I would probably have a hard time using it that way because immediately when I read the directions, unless teachers, I'm sure teachers are modifying it, but the way I read the directions, it sounds like pretty much the kids do all the questions before there's really any interaction between them or between them and the teachers. So it's kind of like a worksheet on the move, which is nice because the kids are, you know, they're up and they're moving. But what I like to see is some opportunity for the kids to you know, get some help or to discuss the ideas along the way. So I took the basic directions and came up with um, Team Scoot, and I wrote about it on Corkboard Connections, my blog. Um, and the best thing to do is just go to Corkboard Connections and search for it, but I did provide um, the link and Peggy spit it in there. But um, I'm not going to go into the full details of it, but I guess what I'm trying to say is when I looked at Scoot, I, I liked it, but I felt like it lacked that engagement of kids being able to talk together and get clarification on their ideas. And when you think about whoever's doing the talking is doing the learning. If they're spending 30 minutes scooting around the room and it's totally quiet, that might be nice for the teacher, but the learning is not going to be there in the same way it is if you have them scoot around the team and then like every four problems, they talk over you know, what's going on. So anyways, just a little bit of background here on cooperative learning and some of those keys. And then the other uh, cooperative learning strategy I wanted to share with you, um, how many of you have used Showdown before? In fact, let's do the um, use your hand raising tool and um, just raise your hand if you have used cooperative, if you have used Showdown before. So basically it's like kids have dry erase boards, usually there's some task cards in the middle of the team, and the kids flip over a card and everybody works one problem. They don't talk, and then they um, put the boards face down, and then the leader will say showdown, and everybody shows their questions, um, their answers, and then they discuss the answers. Then they just kind of keep repeating it. So um, showdown has equal participation because everybody, you know, each person gets a chance to be a leader. They're all working all the problems. There is the opportunity to, to discuss the answers and clarify any misunderstandings. The accountability um, is that all of them have to participate, like nobody can just sit there, but that also takes the teacher kind of watching that, but also you probably follow up with a quiz or something to make sure that they were mastering the concepts. Um, some of you might know that um, I actually created this showdown structure um, that Kagan shares. Uh, I was writing uh, one of my books for him, which was on, on decimals, discovering decimals, and 
came up with a strategy and I actually talked to Spencer Kagan and asked him, like, here's this thing I'm doing and do you have, is it one of your structures because I don't think it is and he agreed that it wasn't and so it was kind of a new structure so I love sharing that. So one reason I'm sharing it right now is that I took the clickers um, concept and kind of paired it up with Showdown and that's the cooperative learning strategy that I will be sharing. But first, I need to let you know if you want to do these kind of engagement activities with clickers, there's sort of a one-time advanced prep, you know, set of things that you need to do. Once you do this, you don't have to do it every time. And by the way, these, um, these pictures are, some of these pictures here, if they're not mine, they're from the teachers in the Facebook group, so it was great to get those. So the first thing that if you're not using teams, you need to divide your class into um, heterogeneous teams of, I say four, but you know, I mean, you're not usually going to have exactly four, three to five students. Five can be too many. Um, I prefer three and groups of three and four, but sometimes if you have a small classroom, you might have to do groups of four and five. And then um, I don't do team names. I just do like team one, team two, team three. You know, you can have the kids come up with team names, but it's not necessary. Then the next thing, this is the thing that's a little bit different for clickers. If you're going to use clickers with cooperative learning teams, if you think about it, you don't want to use the same cards that you're using with individual students because that's going to mess up your data. So what I suggest doing is in a, in a set of clickers cards that you download for free from their website, there's 40 cards. If you have fewer than 30 kids, you can take the last 10 cards and make them into team cards. So you would have card number 31. Well, I'll show you on the next stage. So anyways, you're going to, um, I suggest putting them on like a pastel color so then you know those are the team cards or you could put like the team numbers or whatever. Um, another suggestion, if you don't want the data from these little you know, extra activities mixing in with your academic assessment data, I suggest just creating a separate class. So like, let's say, you know, you have a language arts class, you have a math class. They may be the exact same kids if you're a fourth grade teacher, but you are listing them as language arts and math because you have different um, content area questions. I suggest coming up with another class, you know, you call it Plickers Fun or Plickers Extra Stuff or whatever, but just make another class name and then all this other fun stuff goes there and it won't mix in um, with your other data. So then what you'll do is for that class, you will enter the student names. Like if your kids have certain numbers, maybe their clickers card number three, then in this class, you want them to have the same number. But then for the teams, <coughs> if you look down at the bottom, um, I entered team one, team two, team three, and then I assigned them those higher number cards. So card numbers 31, 32, 33, 34 probably wouldn't be used in most classrooms, so if they're in there as the team numbers, that's fine. And if you do have a very large class, I know Plickers does have some larger sets of cards too um, that you could use. So I, I just wouldn't do, like in this class, there's 16 students. I wouldn't put number 17 as team one because if you get a new student, you're going to need that card. So. Anyways, hopefully that's clear. Now, here's the directions for the team clickers um, showdown variation. And I have those directions that you see up in the corner. They're on the page that's called Interactive Teaching Web uh, Resources, where the webinar replay is going to go and where the replay is from the first time. So this is a strategy for just reviewing skills or practicing, you know, it could be like a guided practice activity where you want kids practicing together. Now, I do say team clickers, I say team, you know, you could do some groups of two for partners, but usually showdown is a little bit better if you have four students. So, I'm going to stop talking for a minute and give you a chance to think ahead, kind of. Think about what subjects and topics you're going to be teaching in the next few days. And then I want you to think about where 
do you need a review activity or a practice activity? Like maybe you're teaching division and you're thinking, you know, I, I really would love to do a division uh, review or practice activity and I bet you I could fit this in, you know, for So anywhere that you would put a review or practice activity, because as I go through the directions, I want you to be thinking about how it's going to fit with your classroom and you know how you might modify the directions and what kind of questions you would use and that kind of thing. So let me just stop for a second. I said I would stop talking. I'm going to read and see what are some of your ideas about. So I see measurement conversions, social studies review, yes. Science reviews would be good. Addition, review for state testing. Oh my goodness. I. In North Carolina, we don't usually start that for a while, so it's always surprising to me when states start their testing so early. Water cycle, vocabulary review, um, dividing decimals, fractions, lots of people studying fractions. Author's purpose, great. French vocabulary, so all of these would be perfect. So <clears throat> before the lesson, what you got to do is enter your review or practice questions. Now, if you're, let's say you're going to do a water cycle review, you're going to put those questions in your science category. Um, but when, if you're going to do a cooperative learning activity with them, you have to assign them to the question queue for your, you know, Plickers Fun class. Now, if this is confusing, if you have not used Plickers. This might be very confusing, but like I said, if you go back to the first webinar and do those things and then come back to this one, I think it should be pretty clear. Um, could I just see your comments in the chat? Like for those of you who've used Plickers, you understand what I'm saying here about you've got to put your questions in and then assign them to that um, class, the, the Plickers fun. Because you have to, before you can use the questions with the students, you, you have to assign them to a, a, a question queue. And if you don't do that, you'll be in front of your students and you're not going to you know, be able to get to the questions and be frustrating. OK. So that's what I'm saying. Plicker, that first webinar I did tells you <laughs> everything you need to know. And I really suggest you watch it because clickers can be very confusing until you get your hands on the device and do it. OK, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to seat your students with their teammates, and you're going to have them number off from 1 to 4. Now, obviously, if you have five kids, you know, it'll be 1 to 5. And put the, the team response card in the middle of the team and tell them, don't touch it. Just leave it there. Then it's best if they have dry erase boards, markers, um, and erasers. Um, one of the teachers in the Facebook group, and I apologize for not knowing, remembering which one and who you were, but one of the teachers said the kids write on their desktops with dry erase markers instead of using their dry using dry erase boards. So that that would work too, and then I guess they would just kind of cover their answer. So uh, they just need a way to respond. So you're going to pull up the first question. Um, it could be a, the task card, a task card question or something that you typed in. Now here's the key part. Without talking, the kids write the answer on their own dry erase boards, and then they put them face down in front of them. Now this is my students doing an activity with place value. It was a decimal place value, probably. Um, and it wasn't with clickers because I didn't have clickers, but they were doing showdown, so I pulled that up there. So remember, they don't talk. Now at first, you have to really monitor that because if the kids don't know that, it's not like they're trying to cheat. They just they didn't listen to your directions, and so they start talking if they don't know the answer. So you just have to say, well, wait a minute. You know, you got to try on your own. If you don't know what to do, put a question mark, but you got to put something on your board. They put their boards face down. And in this uh, method of showdown, you, the teacher, will look around the room, and when it looks like everybody's ready, you'll say, showdown, or show what you know. And then they show their answers, not to you, but they show them to their team. And they talk over their answers. And they try to come up with one answer. So you have to give them time to kind of justify and explain and you know all of that. OK, now, once. They seem to, you know, the talking guy's down and they seem to be ready. Then you, the teacher, you announce a student number. The kid's numbered off from 1 to 4 or 1 to 5, so you might say, student number 3, you're going to respond, showdown. Student number 3 would get the Plickers card, just like this girl in the red 
um, sweatshirt and that she's responding for her whole team. They already came up with the answer. So she holds it up and this is the team card. So you will scan the team card. Um, and then you can show the answers on the Plickers uh, view for the class. Normally you would not show student names and what they're responding, but you could show the student answers here because it's just going to say team one, whether they got it right or not, or you may choose not to. But you're going to reveal the answers, discuss them, and then repeat the steps in each time you're uh, calling on a different student number. And uh, a little tip that I have, um, there's a tendency to want to just make it into a competition. I think it's sort of a natural thing, um, unless maybe you've had some cooperative learning training that discourages it. But um, you know, it's cooperative learning. It's not really competition. And the minute you say, OK, we're going to tally points, and you put up there team one, two, three, four, five, what happens is you've got kids on each team that are really having trouble. They're struggling. And they start getting really frustrated and upset because they perceive that what they're doing is holding their team back. They don't have the right answer. They don't know how to do it. Or maybe you know when it's their turn to respond, they get mixed up and they say the wrong thing or whatever. And so it really shuts down the, uh, yeah, you got those top, those gifted kids. They, all, they love that competition because they're always going to rise to the top. But you put them in an environment where maybe they're, you know, they don't know all the right answers and they're going to feel just like those kids that can be frustrated. So what I found was kids just love showdown. You don't have to turn it into a competition. They just, they just love doing it and you don't have to record anything. It's, you know, I just tell them it's a, it's a fun game for learning. We don't have to have points on this. Now, we think about this and think about, um, let me see if, who can help me out in the chat. I, gave like three kind of key concepts with cooperative learning. So before I go to the next slide, if anybody wants to type in the chat, like what were, what was one of the key things that I'm looking for when I'm looking for cooperative learning? I see accountability. I see participation, especially equal participation and talking. That's right. So think about this for a second before I go to the next slide and think about is there equal participation? If you think about it, they all have to respond on their whiteboards before you call a number. There's uh, an opportunity to talk. Um, I do see um, Peggy put consensus. And consensus sometimes is uh, a part of cooperative learning, although there's kind of different feelings on it. And in fact, this, I'm really glad that you mentioned that, Peggy, because a lot of times the teams won't come to consensus. So what my rule was is let's say person number three on the team just does not agree. Then I say, if your number is called, then you can say what you think the answer is. You just have to be ready to defend it. So I don't like make them come to consensus, but I try to encourage that um, if at all possible. OK, so let's look at some variations that might make it even stronger. So um, I just put purple titles at the top because this is not part of the basic directions and it's not even on the direction page. But here's something that you could do. What if um, every third or four qu fourth question, you didn't let them talk? You just said, all right. I don't, you're not going to have a chance to talk. I want you to get your own clickers cards out, and I want you to tell me, show me what the answer is. So they're going to be on their toes all the time because they don't know whether every once in a while you might not let them have an opportunity to talk, and they've got to put, um, put their you know, uh, boards up with the answer. Um, so, and I kind of gave you one benefit of, of using this strategy. Can you think of any other? benefits besides the fact that it kind of keeps the kids on their toes. Yep, checking for understanding. It's for you as the teacher. Like if you if you go to whole class period and you never have them respond individually, you really don't know which kids are getting it and which kids aren't. 
So, you know, this is your way of getting that formative assessment, like, throughout the cooperative learning. And then I like someone said, um, Patricia said, no one can just sit back and pretend to learn. Like, they've got to be paying attention. You know, the first time you do it, they're probably going to be a little stressed out if they've been doing that whole pretend thing. But then they will actually start to get more um, engaged. And then I see Georgia has students who might be lost in the discussion. They get to have a voice. So from time to time, they're all getting a chance to respond. So, um, and I wouldn't even announce every fourth question. I would just say, hey, from time to time, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you're going to have to respond on your. I see, um, I think it's already gone past. Sally put catch misconceptions. Yes, yes, that's good too. So, all right, let's look at another variation. So, what if you, um, and you know how uh, I said that they work on their dry erase boards, and then they discuss it before you scan any cards. What if they did their work on the dry erase boards, you scanned the cards, but you didn't tell if it was right or not. You just scanned them for your own knowledge. And then you said, all right, turn to your team, talk over your answers, and then you let them change their answer if they realized they were wrong. And then you scanned all the cards again. Then what if, after all of that, you, without revealing, you know, that you know that a student changed, but like you're kind of keeping track, like Johnny had this answer, but now he's changed it. What if you called on Johnny and said, Johnny, could you explain, you know, the, the you know, tell us how you solved it. Then Johnny knows he can't just change his answer to what the group says unless he understands it. So I know, like with fifth grade, when I did this kind of thing, you know, the first time it really threw them off, but then the next time I would hear them saying, no, no, we can't go on. I don't understand. Tell me. <laughs> Help me. I, I don't get how to do this. Like they would really, um, they knew that they might be called on or they might, you know. So anyways, this is another variation. So I guess the reason I threw these in is for you to think about not just taking like a cooperative learning activity that you've learned, but like, you know, feel free to vary it, switch it up, but just kind of keep in mind, you know, that um, individual accountability and the equal participation and making sure there's some time to discuss in there and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it's, it's not like you just have to learn, you know, here are these five cooperative learning activities, but like, you know, you can change it up. Okay, and any questions about this, I will um, answer at the end. So um, we've kind of already talked about this. So Team Clickers Showdown, would you call it group work or cooperative learning? I think hopefully I've convinced you that it is cooperative learning because you've got all of these pieces in place. So now I'd like to just uh, wait for a second and let you share as I was going through this, were you thinking in your mind about like maybe a subject area that you think it would work well, maybe a topic, some questions, um, and then at the end of the webinar we might do some more sharing, but where might you use Team Clicker Showdown? <clears> then <throat> I'll just wait for a second and read some of your comments. Yeah, any math lesson for sure. Right, and if you have, like I said, if you have questions in the chat, type them there and then we can come back to them. Pre-assessment on units. Now, with this, since this particular showdown thing is, you might call it like activating prior knowledge more so than pre-assessment because you won't be really assessing what they know. I guess you would be throughout and by the end, but it would definitely activate prior knowledge. Okay, theme of the story. Okay, one thing kids really like about Showdown um, is they just feel so many kids are uncomfortable being called on. They just they're just stressed out with the in, you know always having everything individual. That being able to talk things over with somebody else kind of gives them confirmation. Like, oh, my team liked my idea. They thought I had a good idea. It really does help build conf confidence. And Patricia said I could use it instead of my smart board game reviews. 
You know, there's a lot of games, and I don't know which ones you're talking about, but there's a lot of games that we use in the classroom that if you stop, after you learn, get some training in cooperative learning, you start realizing there's, a, there's some active engagement there, but it's not really all that equal because a lot of kids are watching and there's just a few kids, you know, um, actually participating. Okay. Now, the second part, which is probably going to be shorter, this, these are some um, unique and innovative ways that teachers in the Facebook group shared about how they use um, poll questions. And the polling questions are just questions that um, they don't have a correct answer. So it could be multiple choice. It could be like agree or disagree, or is this true or false, or yes or no. Um, and I'm going to give you a bunch of examples from the group and some of my own and get you thinking about different ways that you can use clickers, not really for assessment, but more for just like um, communicating with your kids. You'll, you'll see when you look at the examples. So um, what I would suggest that you do is, you know, before I told you to add a new class called Clickers Fun. but um, in your Plickers account, you have a library, where, which is where you have your questions. I would suggest creating a separate folder. You can call it whatever you want, if you just want to call it extra questions or whatever. But I would keep them separate from your content um, questions and just have like a list of these polling questions, and you'll see some examples in a minute. So here's, I clicked um, Add Question, and so what if you had a question like this? Um, how are you going to be leaving school today? You're going to be on the school bus, parent pickup, a daycare pickup, or other transportation. Like sometimes in elementary school, we're supposed to check in with the kids like, what are you, because some kids go to daycare Monday and Thursday, but not on Friday. And you know, it's like, you, but you're supposed to know as the teacher how they're going to be picked up or whether they're going to be riding the bus or whatever. So if you put this question in, do you see how, like I just pointed to the word correct, you don't put correct, like you don't mark it as a correct answer. You just put the question and you put the answer choices. And then later um, at the end of the, at, you might do this at um, maybe like right after lunch or something, you know, how are you going to be going home or maybe even right before they leave so that if somebody, um, parent calls and says, you know, um, Sally wasn't on the bus, where's Sally? And then you pull up your report and you say, well, Sally said she had daycare pickup today. Or Sally said parent pickup, so maybe she's out there waiting. You know, So um, it gives you some actual uh, assessment, not assessment, but like feedback. So then you have to assign those questions to that Plickers Fun Class Q. So here's some ideas from the group. So you could do your lunch count and attendance all together. And I apologize for putting junk food in there, but in my experience, if things haven't changed, um, there's a lot of pizza and burgers and things on the school menu. So I decided to go with the reality rather than maybe what I prefer. But if you had, um, you know, a question, which, what's your lunch choice for today? And then you had in, you know, pizza, burger, I've got a bad lunch or whatever. And then you have the kids scan it. If nobody, if a, um, the clicker system will show you who has scanned it and then who there's no answer for. So if there's no answer for the person, then that's your record that they're absent um, or out of the room or whatever. And then you can figure out where they are and what's going on. Um, secret voting, this is a, just a picture of me in a class meeting a couple of years ago, but oh, in fifth grade we were always voting on things like, you know, where should we go or what movie should we watch or like what book, you know, me, when I said which book should I read or me as a teacher, like I might hold up two books, like I'm thinking about one of these two books, which one do you want me to read? And I love the idea of clickers because it's secret because usually kids will peek and stuff when you ask them to put their heads down and hold their hand up or whatever. So you can do any kind of secret um, voting. Um, opinion and discussion questions. And here's just an idea at the top. You could pose a question, have the kids respond with their clickers, but don't show who's got what. But then you could kind of group the kids together, or you could show them the answers who have the same answer, maybe pair up kids who have different answers, let them discuss it. So you can set it up where um, you just tell them A is true, B is false, 
Um, a is yes, B is no. You could do like A is strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. And then you could have just like an opinion question. Homework is important. And then they put either strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly agree. And it would be, you know, just a good way to get them thinking before they talk. Or in a story, like with Jack and the Beanstalk, agree or disagree. Jack was clever to trade the cow for the magic beans. So get the kids to commit to a certain position and then maybe pair them up with somebody who has a different opinion or let them talk it over in their teams or whatever. So um, great ideas here. Um, a research topic, Michelle uh, Shelby shared this one. Um, if I'm reporting it correctly, they watched a movie that showed a young man um, who was presenting at the United Nations meeting, and then they had like a lesson about it, and then the kids were going to do some um, additional research on that topic, and the kids kind of came up with like what would be four possible topics you could research, and then she put them into clickers, and then the kids were able to show which one they wanted. And she said she really liked that because instead of just saying like what their friends wanted or whatever, you know, they felt comfortable saying what they really wanted to do on their own. So um, I thought that was a neat strategy. Um, you could do it for choosing a literature circles book. Um, I'm pretty big with literature circles. I have a lot of um, literature circles or classroom book clubs materials on my site. The only problem is um, you can only do four choices in clickers. I mean, if you think about the card, there's only four ways to turn it. So you could um, take four choices and then do those and then maybe do some others. Or um, I used to do literature circles sometimes where like, I might only have four different books, but I had two groups that were maybe doing like Maniac McGee, they were Maniac McGee or something, they were two separate groups. You know, if I had like a lot of kids that wanted a certain title, I would make two literature circle groups. But you could also find out like which is the one that they don't want to read so that you don't put them in a group um, where, that they don't want to read. Um, you could do status of the class, like for an example with writing workshop. Um, instead of having a paper checklist, you know, where are you in the writing process? You're planning, you're in the rough draft, you need a conference, you're doing your final draft, you know, same thing with math workshops. So any kind of um, status of the class. And then um, I thought this was really neat. Um, Jessica Vasquez, I, I'm I hope I pronounced your name right, Jessica, um, shared that she uses it to like an emotional kind of thing. Like in the morning, she'll say, how are you feeling today? Excited, happy, worried? I just threw sleepy in there. I don't know if she does sleepy. <laughs> but um, if a student says worried, she will make a point sometime during the day to talk to that child and say, like, what are you worried about, you know? And I just think that's a really neat way of using it. Obviously, she's not revealing anything to the kids. It's for her own use. Um, I put sleepy in there because sometimes kids are just sleepy in the morning. And, you know, if a kid is sleepy every single day um, and that's they're willing to tell me they're sleep, sleepy every single day, then, you know, it's probably time for me to uh, contact the parent and say, you know, for the last five days, your child has said that he's or she's sleepy every morning. Um, it's sort of hard to feel excited and happy if you're if you're sleepy. So, anyways, I just thought that was really something different. And um, so now, what I'd like to do is, if some of you guys have had some ideas, and Peggy, when we get um, after the drawing and everything, you've probably been seeing ideas. Maybe you can just kind of mention some to me later. And maybe I can also go through the um, written transcript and pull up some of the best ideas. I maybe mean, not to say best, but you know, just a variety of different ideas of different types of poll questions. Oh, hungry. Somebody put hungry. Ooh, that's a good one. The thing about just saying, how are you feeling, like, the thing about clickers is you've got to have answer choices. So you as the teacher would have to come up with four different things. Um, trivia um, questions, I see uh, Fran says for trivia questions. Yeah, trivia questions would be fun because you could get the kids to kind of commit to what they think it is, you know, before you reveal the answer. So really kind of keep them on their toes. Class reward choices, I like that. Um, yeah. Monitoring how comfortable they are with the content. So it could be almost like an exit ticket type thing, like 
I need more help. I I feel you know um, I feel like I have it or whatever. I think that's an interesting idea because being that it's private, even more so than paper exit tickets, it's private. So if you had a choice on there, I really need more help with this or something, um, then you, they're able to kind of let you know that without having to say it in front of the class. Okay, algebraic equation solutions. Okay, all right. So I want to um, move on here. And I did want to mention um, that those of you that saw the first session, um, you probably already got these things, but those who didn't, uh, I have a tutorial that's on, um, I think Peggy has the link, it's on that interactive teaching page. It's also in my Teachers Pay Teachers store as a free item. <clears throat> it tells you how to use task cards to create questions so you don't have to type them all in. And then I have a few task card products for sale. Not not a lot, but I have a few, and I I pulled out like two um, task cards from each set and put them in kind of a pack in there with that tutorial, and that's something so that you can practice um, on them. And I did want to mention also that if you enjoyed the cooperative learning aspects of this webinar, and maybe you you know picked up some information that you hadn't heard before about cooperative learning. Um, last year, actually it was a little over a year ago, I did two webinars kind of uh, back to back, back in two months on active engagement strategies. One of them had a lot of like partner and whole group activities and the other one had real like team cooperative learning activities. And I would suggest that you um, go back and watch those. And you know, I don't see any reason why you couldn't add those on to if you're trying to get a professional development credit. Those are like hour long webinars. You could certainly add those as um, webinars for credit. Okay, it's time for a giveaway. So here's what we do. You're going to be using that hand raising tool to um, raise your hand. You can do that right now while I'm talking. And you can, if you win, you can get a set of laminated Plickers cards if you're in the United States. I will have them mailed to you straight from Amazon. You'll probably have them um, next week. Or if you already have the Plickers cards or, you know, you're thinking, well, I can just print those out at school. Um, that's fine. They will take a lot of ink when you print them. Luckily, it's only a one-time deal. You can also choose to get $20 worth of um, products from my Teachers Pay Teachers store if you'd rather have that. And I already have a number that I did a, like a random number selection um, ahead of the class. And um, the first number that came up was 190. And we don't have 190 people. So I have another number. And I'm going to scroll down and see who it is. And I am I'm just doing like a little screen capture because sometimes the numbers change. Okay, and it is, um, I apologize if I say your name wrong, but Lamari Rivera is the winner. Lamari, are you, you must be here because you just raised your hand. So if you want to put something in the chat, say yay, I won. <laughs> um, I will be contacting you after the webinar and getting information from you about whether you want the um, Flickr's cards or whether you want the products from the store or what you want. So I'll find you on, in your registration information. If you don't hear from me, you can um, email me at contact at laurakandler.com and, um, and I'll be in touch with you that way. So, okay, let's move on. So um, the next webinar is March 15th. It is not on Plickers. I, I did two sessions on Plickers because there was just so much to say. Um, <clears throat> I don't really have an official title yet, but it's on using um, a sorting activities, like a hands-on sorting strategies. You can use some basic cooperative learning strategies in like any subject area. Just I'll have a wide variety of ideas. I'll be <coughs> excuse me, um, getting teachers to contribute their ideas and uh, just, you know, kind of digging into how you can use this one strategy in a variety of ways. So that one will probably be shorter even though I, I, I can't promise because when I start working on these I start thinking of lots of different ways to use them. So I hope you'll join me for that. I will be sending out an email with, the, um, you know, that says the webinar reply link. 
Okay, <laughs> obviously that should say the webinar replay link um, and details about how to sign up for the next webinar. And I did want to um, say thanks to the, uh, the clip artist who provided such great artwork for me. Um, once again, the professional development certificate is on the webinars page on my website. If you just download it and read the information, it tells you exactly what to do. And I wanted um, Peggy to tell you a little bit about um, something that she's been involved in every Saturday for a very long time. It's really exciting. So um, Peggy, why don't you tell them about Classroom 20 Live before we go to the um, sharing session. Oh, and one more thing. If you log out before you go to the sharing session, there'll be a survey that pops up. Don't respond to it <laughs> because it's for Classroom 20 Live. It's not for me and I will not see it and it will not get you a certificate. So. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning that, Laura. I'll make this really fast because I don't want there to be much time between getting to the questions and answers for all the great things that have been shared about Flickers today. But I do want to invite all of you, if you don't know about Classroom 2.0 Live, that is a weekly webinar that we do for teachers who want to learn to use technology in their classrooms. And we have different guest presenters and um, sometimes we have panels, often it's teachers and you can uh, click on that link and you can go see the archived recordings of all the shows we've done before and I'm sure you'll find something of interest to you. We try to focus on free tools and free resources that you can use and to share strategies for using them very similar to what Laura has done today. So I hope that you'll check it out. We meet every Saturday at noon Eastern Standard Time and we will always post the recording if you'd like to, if you can't make it on Saturday but would like to hear what was being shared, um, feel free to check out the archives. So with that, let's move on to questions and answers, Laura. You want to turn your microphone on, Laura? Sorry about that. I was just settling back in my chair, just talking away. <laughs> I said, do you, <laughs> do you have any questions um, that you, you know, collected that you would like me to address yes. right up front? Okay. Yes. And, and I, I was waiting for you to say those very words and I didn't <laughs> hear them. So, um, one question, uh, Stephanie wanted you to clarify where the tutorial um, was found. Uh, is it on Teachers, Teachers Pay Teachers or on your blog? Well, actually it's in two, two places. It is in my Teachers Pay Teachers store, so if you go there, there's actually a link in the sidebar on my store, and I think I gave you the TPT store link. There's a link in the sidebar on, on TPT that says Clickers Resources, and it has the, when you click on that, it brings up the free tutorial and also brings up any product I have that has Clickers cards with it. Like, I've actually started making Clickers cards to go with some of my other products just as a way of giving, you know, just kind of throw them in there as a bonus, and anybody who's already bought the product, they can just go get those for free. It's kind of like right. now that I know about clickers, I'm trying to add these in as a little extra assessment um, bonus. Okay. Um, Amy asked, and this group is so great because people ask questions and then other people answer them, but Amy was asking if it's possible to share questions with other teachers, and it sort of sounded like it's not a feature yet. Is that correct? Yes. Um, you cannot share questions with other teachers, and um, in fact, they've even set it up where you can't share an account with another teacher because if they're logged in in their classroom, you it, you can't log in in your classroom because that's kind of <coughs> the word that I heard. And some people might say, well, you know, we'll just share an account, we'll set up our own classes, but you can't even do that. Um, I mean, you know, Plick, the folks at Plickers, um, I've corresponded with them a little bit. Nobody over there is admitting 
any plans they have for a premium <laughs> version, but you know they've got to. I mean, somebody's got to be paying the bills over there. Yes. And of course you expect it. And so I'm just thinking that they'll probably roll out, you know, premium features one day and maybe they'll have it like if the school buys it, then the teachers can share the database or something. But right now, um, no. But they, yes. did, they did assure me, though, I did ask, when you roll out your premium, I said when, when you <clears> roll out your premium version, will, you know, the things that are free now, like, that was, uh, the, the features that are free now, like teachers being able to add their own questions, is that still going to be free? And the lady said, yes, those features Great. would still be free. So that was that a, good a good question thing. to ask. <laughs> we always want to know. <laughs> I know. I don't want them to take away the free stuff that they've already given us. And I did share a link in the chat um, mm -hmm. as you were speaking that there is a forum for ideas and suggestions for new features on the Plicker site. Mm -hmm. And you can either add new ideas or vote on ideas that are already there. So if there's something you'd yeah. really like to see, I think the more people that have yeah. interest in it, the more likely it is that they will consider adding that. And that's probably like they just last month rolled out the the spreadsheet feat like feature where it's yes. called score sheet. Yes. That is awesome. And I forgot to mention that I discovered that you can print um even like if you wanted to print the lunch count, you can't it didn't look like you can print it directly from the score sheet, but I saw an export link and you can export it to uh Excel. And after you export it to Excel, you know, it has all the data right there. Then you can print your results if you, you know, if you need a printed copy of something. So I thought, you know, I thought that was pretty interesting. So yeah, yes, that's I, they great. obviously are listening. Um, and uh, the question came up again about whether you can laminate the cards and whether there are issues with glare. Could you just mention that one more time? Yes. Um, different teachers in the Facebook group have said different things about this. Um, a number of people have said that there is a glare and it kind of depends, I think, on the lighting in your classroom and all of that. And so um, unless you have like a matte finish on your lamination film and it suggested that mm. if you want to laminate them, you do like one, like maybe take card number 40 that you're not going to use, laminate one card and then test it, not just in one place, but like you know, have a kid go around the room and test it in different places yes. to make sure it will read because if not, um, a lot of teachers do end up buying the $20 cards on Amazon because it has like a matte finish and they hold up really mm -hmm. well and they figure it's worth the investment. That's a great suggestion. Um, there was also a question about what Rhonda wanted to know, can you trace over the letters so that her students can see them a little bit better? Okay, so the letters um, on the card are really tiny, you know, because they don't want kids to be able to look and see what other kids are <laughs> doing, but you could certainly go over them because I don't think that would affect the reading of it, but what um, a lot of kindergarten and first grade teachers do is there's... Um, Actually, I, I know it's, it's a product on Teachers Pay Teachers. It's just a couple of dollars. Um, one of the ladies in the Facebook group made it, but it's like um, you print it out and you glue it on the back of the cards and it has like the letters large and then I think it might even have like animals for the letter. Like it's very primary. Upper grade mm. people would not want that because those, right. you know, even second and third would probably be looking to see which letter they were holding up. Now, some teachers say they have the kids hold it kind of up against their, their tummy, mm -hmm. you know, so that nobody can, see, can see the, the back, back of the card yeah. once they've got it positioned right. Mm -hmm. And I just saw a question from Michelle. Let me just mention, she says, I think it's a lot of work to enter all the questions. That was in the first session. Um, I talked about how you can use task cards and you can uh, create images of them and upload task cards. I mean, you could also just put them under your document camera, but then you wouldn't have any data in the system. But you could actually t um, do like screen captures of task cards and then enter them pretty quickly. And a lot of teachers do that and they say, you know, it works really well. Great. Okay. What else do we have? Um, there was some interest in whether you would be talking 
talking about high school students today. And I did mention that you have a, a high school or a secondary Clickers Facebook group. Right. So maybe you could comment on that. Right. Um, so this, the things that I shared today, you know, I think could be used. But when I set up the first Clickers group, I saw like the kinds of comments and things that were going on, and I thought this is elementary teachers have very different needs from secondary teachers. Mm -hmm. So I um, actually asked a friend, Chris Kessler, who is um, Kessler Science. He has a great blog and Facebook page and mm -hmm. CPT store and everything. I asked him if he would be interested in you know, setting up a uh, Plickers group, Facebook group for like K-12 teachers. And he did do that. It's, it's not just for science 12, teachers. Right? Um, but um, and on the page that I gave you the link to, Peggy, it's like the um, interactive teaching page. Right. It has links to both. But I'm just going to go ahead and say this: if that group does not have as many people and it's not nearly as active, and it doesn't bother me at all if somebody who's like a high school teacher wants to join the K-5 group, because in the K-5 group, I think we have like 700 people now. I think the 612 group only, you know, has like 150 or something. So if you're just having like basic questions about how to use it, the people in the K-5 group can help. It's more like the secondary group, I see it for more like um, grading and, you know, just more issues about how it would be used at that level, you know. So anyways. Yes, and you want them to sign up for that that group from your interactive teaching page, isn't that right? Right. There's like uh, two Google Doc links. You go to yes. Google Doc and you put your name and all that, and then it tells you like where to go to click on the, the, the link to join. Yes, so that's how you get approved to join the group by right. starting with that Google Doc right. first. Right. Okay. Um, there was a question, Becky had a great question about why there might be a problem loading pictures on a Mac. She said uh, if she adds an image on her Mac, it doesn't load, but it shows on a PC. Do you know about that? <laughs> well, I might be able to help with that one next week because I, I, for those who were here before the webinar started, I'm a, I'm a PC girl and have been that way for a long time, but I have envied Mac users, both my daughters have them, and uh, the publisher, Microsoft publisher, kept holding me back. But I actually just uh -huh. bought a Mac uh, laptop, and so I can check that out next week. But okay. uh, yeah, I see Donna says, once you go Mac, you'll never go back. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm excited about I mean, it. I had to force you, myself. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had to force myself not to touch it today because I was trying to do the finishing touches. So I don't know. If anybody in here uses a Mac, could you please help out with that question? Do you know if there's any issues about um, uploading images with the Mac computer? Because that's really, that would be a good question for the Facebook group. Yes, Surely it people in that group. That's a great idea. I it would be different. Post it yeah. there. Oh. Okay, Becky says, I think it's a blocked website by my school, meaning the website is oh. the pictures is blocked. Yeah, like Flickr might be blocked if you uploaded your pictures to Flickr. Yeah, but it seems like if you uploaded your pictures at home, and then you open the Flickr's account. I can't see. That's really weird. Okay, but anyways, whoever okay. asks the questions, please join the Facebook group, and we can, we can uh, look into it as a group and see if we can figure it out. Yes, that's great. Um, and let's see. Uh, Becky was interested in hearing some more ideas for ways you could use clickers um, for practice in PD for exit tickets. For for practice, what was the first thing? She just wants more practice or opportunities oh, okay. to uh, see how you use them as exit tickets? Um, well, I think that a lot of that was covered in the first session, so I'm not yeah. sure. Maybe she was didn't watch that. So I would say to watch the first session, because that's kind of the uh, formative assessment use. And we went yes. into quite a bit of detail there. And then this session was kind of um, 
you know, the extra things that you can do that you might not actually think. Most people would not think of clickers as being something you could use with cooperative learning. Mm -hmm. These other poll questions I just thought were so <laughs> unique and interesting. And I think that there were uh, some links shared for exit ticket ideas mm -hmm. on, um, um, I'm trying to think where what, it was. Yeah, what, I'm uh, trying to think it, what kind of links there would be. I think that we were sharing them for Pinterest. Oh, but. The, the, where the ideas were posted. I don't know. If it could be. Could be um, I do have a blog. You know what? I do have a blog post that's um, it's called um, Clickers 101 Exit Tickets and More or something. So maybe yes, somebody right. was. That might be, and I hadn't even thought about that. So, um, yes, yeah, if, if you just go to, uh, actually, I have a whole Clickers Pinterest board that there's a link to it on that interactive um, teaching strategies page. Okay, Peggy's That's, got I posted the, the link there. Peggy's got the um, link to the Plickers 101 digital exit tickets. Yes, that yes. that would be a good place. But most of that stuff was like what I covered in the. For, you know, I covered some of that kind of stuff in the first one. Right. Round. Okay. Um, I think that pretty well covers. Okay. Oh, one last question. In okay. the showdown, are they all answering all the same question? Okay. Good, good uh, question. In this Plickers model, yes, because it's a whole group thing. In um, the actual showdown, like, where you're not doing it guided by the teacher, but it's more cooperative learning, you can give each team like a different um, differentiated set of task cards. So if you were doing division showdown, you could group the kids that had similar abilities and you know it could be like this group gets task cards where you're dividing by one digit. This group gets task cards where you're dividing by multiples of ten or whatever. But in with clickers, it, it's a whole group um, kind of interaction. So that would be really confusing to the kids to be putting up different questions and all of that. So yeah, you have to just kind of, the teacher just has to, you know, kind of pace the kids along um, on that. Great. I think that's all the questions. Yeah. OK. And then if there's um, anybody that wants to share any other ideas about how they might use it. Um, I think some of that's been going on, so it might be. There's lots of great yeah. ideas in the chat, so we'll probably want to pull those out. Yeah, that's what I was thinking is um, I don't know if we've let them know that uh, there's going to be the webinar recording. Um, I will create a PDF of the whole presentation that you can just kind of click through for review. I wish I had remembered yes. to say that up front. And then the chat um, will I be, what did you do in did you tell them? I can't remember. Yes. OK. So they can scroll through the chat and look for some other ideas. And then I might try to pull out some of the best ones. So great. Anyways, this was yeah, a, little, a little longer, but hopefully worth it. <laughs> um, and some ideas to get people going uh, with some more ways to use clickers. OK. Great. Um, so I, I will stop the recording. Then. Sure. OK.